How's it going, folks? So welcome back. Uh, if you haven't checked out before, this is going to be Industry Mind Games, if the name hasn't changed yet, because that's a really bad name. But uh, I am sitting here with Clutch, Joshua Gray himself, the most beautiful man in esports. How's it going? It's good. I remember somebody called me the prom king of esports one time, and I thought, uh, I'll take it. It's a compliment. <laughs> I'll take it. Thank you for the compliment. You're just, you're just so awesome, man. So let's go ahead, uh, sort of dive in here. Uh, what, what do you do currently, and so how do you, do you really get to where you are uh, in esports? Sure. Uh, I'll give you the long and the short of it. The short of it is I'm currently a creative producer at ESL America, which I'm very excited to be a part of. I've been a member of the ESL family since back in May, um, and I had worked on predominantly World of Tanks along with StarCraft WCS uh, before with the NESL group, but unfortunately they went out of business, and ESL America was moving in just the right time, and they were one of the first people that they contacted to see if I wanted to be a part of their American invasion, and I said, well, if there's anything I that I know it's America, so I'm totally I'm totally down, uh, and it's been a great ride so far. It's incredible. We we built the studio in Burbank, which is a prime location, a really great location for any type of media because Burbank is the media city of California, and so many shows and so many uh, episodes are are filmed here in this city. I mean, Conan O'Brien, who I'm a huge fan of, his show is 10 minutes down the street, and so to have that type of real estate really opens up a lot of conversations with people working in the inter entertainment industry and it's a really good step for ESL, it's a great step for us, we have a lot of great people there that are working very very hard on multiple projects and as a creative producer I help out with a lot of those projects and how to implement certain ideas and how to create a show, how to create an experience for people and I learned a lot uh, doing that being an actor growing up but also just being a host for the last five years, four and a half years, five years in the new media world, the, the esports world, the gaming world, and working with a lot of different brands and a lot of different clients has really opened up to what I think is, is right and what works, not just from a host or a talent, but from an audience point of view, and to be able to work on projects and have a say on projects and have power with projects towards the beginning of the planning stages is great for me because I feel I can really help out to create these these shows or make these shows even better. Um, now I still could do that a little bit just as talent, just in front of the camera, because uh, you'll you'll know that the hosts such as myself and and Rachel Querico and others. I mean, we produce sometimes live what's happening. The the uh, production teams like, hey, we need to do something right now to fill time. What do we have? And then we'll run out there as a host or have something kind of pre-produced, ready to go. Be in an interview with somebody or an interview with a player or grab a random fan. We try to create those moments, and it's it's really important to me to have that because it entertains the audience. But to try to plan the time or to block out the time correctly in a run of show and working with the director as a producer to make these moments real and fun rather than as kind of fill time if, let's say, you know, something's wrong, there's a technical issue. So for me, it's very, very exciting. I love the creative process and working with these other people. I've always loved that, being an actor. And now I get to work uh, more behind the scenes, which is great. And it teaches me a lot about the business side as well, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, so that's the long and short of it, man. That's what I've been up to, and, and um, I'm really excited for 2015. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So I mean, you kind of touched on it there, but uh, what's the what's the average day for you? I mean, when you step into the office, what's the average day look like, and and sort of how do you tackle your day? Sure. Uh, for a lot of people, people at the office, it's a nine to six job. Arrive at nine, leave at six. Uh, my schedule is a little bit different because I am the play by play commentator for World of Tanks, and our show is Tuesdays and Thursdays along with any type of weekend show that we do that I'm involved in. Uh, we did the Halo event recently, and um, getting more involved with Halo has been very exciting as well. And so my day-to-day -day is today, woke up at, at, in the morning, jump rope for about uh, a couple minutes, did about 1,000 jump ropes, and then, because you've got to work your cardio in the morning. It's how you get your blood pump. And then after that, uh, head into work. And it's usually meetings, uh, taking notes, uh, or creating notes for myself for the World of Tanks show the next day, talking with teams, kind of pre-interviewing what type of, of questions we want to ask, not necessarily controlling questions that we, the the hosts, are bringing to the show, but what creates the best storyline, what creates the best response from these players. Because we interview the team captains or team representatives before every match in a face-off to 
sort of cr try to create those moments. Uh, we have a pregame show that is to the minute. We know what we're talking about, what we're discussing, and sort of make sure that that's all really tight. Uh, that's a 15-minute show before every Tanks broadcast. So we work with that, and that's a pretty well-oiled machine. We have a fantastic team. And so when I'm not doing those things, the majority of my time is spent on working on other projects or um, kind of developing maybe something new that we can create or looking at the studio schedule, looking at what we have for Hearthstone, looking at what we have for uh, Halo in the future potentially, looking at what we have for other projects in the future, and try to put those things down on paper, what this looks like, how long the broadcast looks like, who's involved, who we would have for talent, and then after that, working as a team to put a budget together. And then we have people come in to us and say, hey, we want to do this show, or hey, we want to do this, or we want to do that. And what does that look like? How much is it going to cost? And to really talk with them and say, what do you want to achieve? What do you want the show to look like? Is this a one-off event? Are you trying to create a league? Is this uh, more of a promotional thing? And so we look at those goals and try to make those goals come to life for our clients. And so that's what a typical day is. It's not the same necessarily every day. And it's fun because it also involves travel, which is is always a plus. Uh, usually, sometimes airports get a little daunting, and then being six foot two in an airplane for five hours gets a little bit uh, cumbersome, sort of, you know, sitting like this a lot. But it's it's a very very exciting time in general for the space itself. Uh, gaming continually brings in a lot of money that a lot of people are taking notice of, especially film studios. And to be in Burbank, surrounded by film studios. All I can say is that it really makes a difference with location and who walk who walks into your studio, man. It's pretty cool. Yeah, man, that sounds awesome. But I mean, so you brought you brought it up again of of you're trying yeah. to build, you're trying to create experience, you're trying to get people interested, keep get people involved, and and really kind of uh, up the excitement level. When you get a project, when you get something on your desk, or you get a, a client bringing up something to you, what's the first thing that pops into your head? Is it the grand image? Is it the the kind of space you want to create? What what pops into your head first? What's the first thing that you heard? Yeah, the first thing, the, the first thing is what's the why would I watch this? Why would I personally watch this? What is it? What's in it for me? What type of entertainment value does it have? And where can I find that? Where's the truth in that in an audience watching this? And to, and to know the audience, what the audience likes, what's really cringeworthy, what they don't like. And I know the biggest things that we're working on is is better award ceremonies. And if you guys are fans of sports, we. We watch uh, traditional sports. I'm a big Seahawks fan, so obviously I was going crazy this weekend. But I watch the post-game interviews, the, the flow of the show, what's happening next. And uh, I have to say, it really makes a difference when players are media trained. It really makes a difference when players know what they want to say or how they want to say it. Uh, and language is always a barrier to, uh, obviously, if they speak a different language, the, the, the flow and the momentum is... is a little bit different. It's not bad or wrong. It's just different. How to adjust to those things. And so you think, okay, how do I create superstars for these players? What do we do? Well, we look at what type of media we could package in together with the show. Let's say the broadcast is like uh, six hours long. It's a long time. It's a long time for one person to sit down and watch something. That's why you know films are ninety minutes to maybe three hours, and television shows are half hours, hours, and sports shows are in three hour blocks because they understand an audience can get a little bit antsy after a while. It's a little bit different with our Twitch audience. Uh, we have longer broadcasts because after a while more and more people kind of accumulate to watch. Um, anyway, so so looking at, you know, okay, how long is the broadcast? All right, six hours. All right, for the first hour block, what do we want to do? Well, we want to highlight this match featuring this player. Okay, so what we need to do is film an interview with this player and make it very specific to this match. Create hype for it. Do we release an interview ahead of time to create hype for it, or do we hold on to it until the actual broadcast? So we're thinking about all these different things. You know, what's happening every 15 minutes? What's happening every minute in these shows? And that's what a, a producer, along with working with the director, tries to do to, to, to create this package. Uh, I don't want to reveal too much because I don't want to like give away too much trade secrets. No, of course <laughs> not. Of course. Or uh, kind of my style, but. In, in kind of the most general terms, you have an idea or somebody else's idea, and you look at ways to improve it. Um, and to, 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 do, to do that on a piece of paper and then to present the idea to somebody and to really sell that idea, say, listen, I really believe in this. I really believe in this show, or I believe in this type of format, or I believe in having a media day uh, in front of a season. A, a really good example of this is with World of Tanks, we have – a media day set up before the season where we fly in the team representatives 
and we do interviews and goofy blooper segments, and um, we also sit down with them and talk about tactics with each individual player. And those pieces are edited throughout the season so that every week we're debuting something new. So the audience always has something new to look forward to outside of the matches themselves. We create a package show. And that's the next step in esports, the next evolution of esports, is that audiences uh, really can't tolerate somebody turning on a stream in their room and streaming a premier broadcast anymore. It's, it has to be bigger than that. Uh, the audience is expecting that. And, and as you continue to increase production value, more and more companies – that have money to spend that are looking at how to market to our demographic, this 18 to 35 male, which is predominantly the, the viewership of, of esports. Of course, you know, we have female viewers and older viewers and even younger viewers, which is great. But how to market to that. And they look at the power of, of Twitch and these, these broadcasts. And then when they can see there's actual production value to it, it, it may, may not be a one-to-one -one comparison compared to television because you have a lot of union specialists in television. But to see a comparison, they go, okay, we feel more comfortable spending money this way. We feel more comfortable promoting on Twitch, promoting with this show, promoting with ESL. And, and, and that's really the stage that we're at now. And that's what we're working hard to increase the production value and to increase the storytelling aspect of it. There's all, so many players uh, in esports that you know their call signs, you know, but that's all you know about them. You don't know their real names. You don't know where they come from. You don't know what's at stake for them. And that human emotion, that human element is always really important for any type of broadcast to connect an audience to the stars, to the players. And so we look at how to improve that. Yeah, uh, so you brought, you brought it up a little bit too with the uh, the media training. And so in Korea, I know there's a lot of community criticism that we've had in the past or maybe currently. I'm not sure if it's still around of players being too trained in terms of like maybe the Kespa players maybe being too sort of rigid and, and sort of cookie cutter in terms of their answers. Oh. Has, oh, has that yeah. gotten improved? I mean, um, where's your stance on that? Is there... I mean, KESPA is an organization, along with a lot of the Korean culture, that's very image conscious in a very healthy way. I don't mean unhealthily wise. Well, you can argue about the plastic surgery, but whatever. <laughs> um, the, uh, the thing about it is that because of their culture and history as a nation, even back in the 1980 Olympics, where they really cleaned up Seoul, and this is why Seoul is my favorite city in the world that I've been to, is it's so clean and they take such great pride in who they are and where they live. There's no graffiti anywhere, there's no litter anywhere, and I really, really enjoyed that. Um, but I don't mean to, to, to sidestep the question, but just kind of adding into the cultural differences. There's so much media training that goes into the Castle players, how much I don't know, but obviously more than zero. Um, but culturally, they're, you know, they're more reserved. And then when you would see these players come to America and see the audience, the crowd, go nuts for them, that is something that they really liked and that their outward personality could shine a bit more and affect the audience a bit more in the U.S. In the US market. And so you would see players uh, bring that out a little bit. But unfortunately, a lot of them were just too shy or didn't know how to really capture the moment for themselves. And I have tried to tell this to some players, like, listen, say something that everybody kind of wants to hear. And you may think it's dumb or it's a little too silly. And I don't mean to say something that's outlandish or stupid, but to say something like, hey, this victory is mine and I'm going to share it with the American people. Or this victory is mine and I'm, I'm going to take it home to Korea or something like that. Something that's worthy of a soundbite really helps an audience feel impacted enough to root for you. And when you can have that, you have a trained host that can help bring that out and create this moment. I feel it's very, uh, very important. So that's what I mean by media trained. Um, again, uh, the Kespa players, when we did that event for Major League Gaming, when they invited the Kespa players for the first time, oh, the and they hops. came up and, and, and one of them did a backflip and stuff like that. I mean, that was so memorable. And it, it was a process for these players to open up a little bit. And JP and Wani... Uh, J.P. McDaniel and, and Wani, who is a uh, translator for, from Korea and a staple in Korean esports over there, helped out behind the scenes right before we're going out uh, on the stage. And to give you guys a little bit more of an inside look at what it's like to be a host and a producer at the same time, is we were behind uh, behind the stage and we're getting ready for this you know, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock uh, event on Saturday night when all these Kessler players were going to show up. And there's a little bit of talk of people like, oh, you know, Halo's way louder than StarCraft. And I said, don't worry. Saturday night, you'll hear the StarCraft audience. 
So we're behind the stage, and, and the director, along with one of the other producers, is saying, hey, what do we do it this way? Why don't we have Flash come out with the Terrans and the Biden Terrans? And I said, no. I flat out said, no. This is the lineup. I wrote it down. Flash is last. And I will say, you know, their, their gamer name. Um, in front of that, they'll have a little moniker that some of the players already had or some of them didn't have. And so we made it up on the fly, like uh, Soul Key. He didn't have a moniker in front of him, so we, I came up with the Grim Reaper. I mean, Soul Key, hold the keys to your soul, the Grim Reaper. I thought it was kind of cool. But it just came up on the fly to help create a pattern for each introduction of these players. And once that pattern was established, their lineup was formed. One of them's like, hey, can I say something in English? And we said, yeah, sure, no problem, that'd be great. And then another one went, well, I want to say something in English now. And so all of them all came up with something to say in English except for one player who I think was, he didn't really know English that well, or was too shy or whatever, he just chose not to, which is fine. And with all those things lined up, you have a structure, you have who's coming out first, who's saying what that I wrote down. And I, I mean, we created all that, but I had to take direction on what I wanted, what I visually wanted to see because I knew the audience would love it. And that's what it means to be a producer, in a sense. Uh, and so it happened, and it happened. You guys saw the result, and it was great. One of my favorite moments uh, in esports. But that takes that takes a certain vision, a dedication. You have to believe in that, and you have to you have to evangelize that to other people. And if they can see it, and if that vision's better than theirs, then awesome. But if it's not, listen to them. Listen to what they have to say to see if it's not a good idea. <laughs> uh, and hopefully, you're surrounded by other professionals that are smart enough and good enough. Uh, to see that. And a lot of people at MLG were, a lot of great people there, and everyone that I've worked with the, with ESL is like that as well. And ESL, they've been doing this for a long time, and so for them to to put this this uh, mantle kind of upon the, these new U.S., these American guys, and to carry the torch of ESL here in America, it's definitely a risk, definitely a gamble, but one that's completely paid off since we started back uh, in May. Um, but I hope that gives you guys kind of a... a, a very succinct uh, example of, of, of what that world is kind of like of trying to put together something that's that's creative and fun and, and really makes a difference to the audience. I mean, I'm sure it made a difference compared to not introducing them at all or just having very straight-laced introductions or bringing them all on stage at once. Instead, we you know, had this vision, one by one by one, let them present themselves, let them be themselves, show themselves to this American world for the first time for StarCraft II, and it really got accomplished. And that's just one, that's, that's one example that's happened over and over again for me in my life. And I don't mean to take all the credit, but uh, just having an idea, having a vision for it coming to pass, coming to life and improving upon that over and over again. It's, it's really fun. It's really fun. It's like a filmmaker. It's like a filmmaker making better films and better films and better films the longer they keep doing it. Absolutely. Uh, so, Clutch, when you're coming up with these visions, I mean, you, you talked so much about your vision and, and what you see in your head. Do you see it Right away, you see, you have this grand vision, or are you, are you do you build it up and then scale it down to what you can do, or are you building it slowly as as you're going through the process? That's a, it's kind of all of it at once, man. It's kind of all those different <laughs> scenarios. Um, I I'll think of hey, what do I really enjoy from sports, and how do we incorporate that incorporate that, that into esports? Or I really enjoy this about the show, or I really would like to interview that person. How do I make that happen? And then you make it happen, and then. Uh, with any vision, there has to be money behind it for it to come to pass. Uh, sorry to break everybody's hearts, but money makes the world go round, especially in esports, um, because there's a value to everything, right? People's jobs are on the line, and so when you have this idea, or you have this vision, you think, okay, why am I doing this? What benefit is there? And a lot of it is this is this is better storytelling. This incorporates the audience more, it's more impactful to the audience, it's more fun for the audience, it's more lasting. And after you start to realize, okay, well, why do I want to create this type of show? Well, it's because I want to create a destination. I want people to know that this show is live. You know, our World of Tanks show, our pregame show is live every Tuesday and Thursday at 4.45. And our first match goes live at 5 p.m. Pacific time. That's a destination. You're creating something that people flock to Instead of, and there's nothing wrong with this, but instead of turning on Twitch and watching whoever you want to watch or feel like it, you know, that's kind of like channel surfing, but for us, it's a destination. And when, you know, for example, uh, Cameron Reed, a.k.a. Cam Dozer, who's a great director, he had this idea to do a Talking Tanks episode that was way better than what we'd done before. What we did before was a little bit rushed. Uh, 
our client liked it, they enjoyed it, but we, we had a lot of information to go through, and we presented it in a very concise way in a half-hour show. And Cameron was not a big fan of it, and, and I, did, I, I tried to get, let my ego get bruised. He was like, oh, I, I thought it was terrible. I'm like, well, we tried to do the best we could with the time that we had, but he was right. You know? So it's kind of that, well, yeah, you're right. How do we improve it? And so he came up with these different improvements. He set up uh, an interview. He set up a, a live interview in the studio, and we hashed out all these ideas, and we made this show work. And we aired this show live last Tuesday, and in my – in my mind, it's one of the best produced shows ever in the world of esports. An hour-long show, and to me, it was it was like watching Sports Center. Man, it was so well done. Now, does it have the same production values as as Sports Center? No, <laughs> we don't have a half a million dollar studio we're working with, but we're working with the best, at least in America, when it comes to an esports studio. And we put out this killer show. And so what that does to us is it raises the bar for us as a production company. It raises the bar for us as ESL America going, okay, if we can do this for this budget, imagine what we could do with a bigger budget or imagine what we could do for a different game or imagine what we could do in a different scenario. So everybody benefits. The client loves the show. The audience loves the show, raves about it. And we love the show and we get behind it and we're all very excited to continue to work you know, with World of Tanks, whatever show that we're on. Um, but it does check your ego a little bit when you, when you work really hard and it's not good enough, you realize, well, you, you need to add more people. Um, it's not necessarily you, you fail, just the project needs more minds, more manpower to make it better. And that's what happened with, with talking tanks. So I was very grateful for that process. Um, I hope that answered your initial question. If not, I can, I can go. No, it, to it totally does. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we keep comparing it to real sports and to where, TV is now and where the production value is now, we've seen a huge jump with, you know, whether it be the IEMs, with WCS, with all the, you know, Riot World Championships. We've seen this huge, huge kind of burst in, in production value. So where sort of are we headed and how close are we to that sort of next level? Well, that's kind of the big question, right, of, of what's next? How do we get to that level? Um, this is... This is only my speculation. This is I'm not talking on behalf of ESL. I'm talking as Joshua Gray, the human being. Um, production value is very, very key right now, and also understanding less is more. This is the biggest principle that I'm trying to live by, and I wish other production houses out there would understand. Uh, I, under I understand why you have to have a six-hour-long broadcast right now in the Twitch world, um, because you accumulate more viewers. To me, I don't want to broadcast anything longer than three hours. I don't. If I have a finals event, I only want that finals event to last three hours. Now, there could be a lead-up to it. There could be you know, a qualifier lead-up, or there could be a broadcast that people are watching that are enjoying that you have you know, a different team run or, or it's kind of like Team B, but Team A is the finals event. And I really want you know, these three-hour, highly produced shows because what that does is it shows that we have the competence to do what television does. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to do what television does. We have the competence to do what it does, and that allows more money to come in. That's bigger sponsors. That's Ford, Toyota, Nissan. That's more Papa John stuff, Pizza Hut, Pepsi, Coke. Everybody in that world of, of television understands how the television system works because it's worked for so long. Do you know why – Fall shows start in the fall. They start in the fall because that's when car sales happen. That's why fall shows all begin, you know, or your, your long-running series, your 20-episode shows begin in the fall is because that's when car manufacturers are trying to sell cars and they're willing to spend that money. So that system was put in place a while ago, and that's how we enjoy it now as, as, as the audience. And, and for us to recognize those patterns, those trends, that understanding, that mutual understanding between television and their sponsors, the more adaptable we will be with conversations with those sponsors. As long as we continue to increase that production value, that money will look – our, our demographic and our production and our audience will look more attractive to them. They, they look at, hey, they have a wonderful delivery system. People are watching their tournaments. Let's get behind this. We're starting to see it now. We really are. It is a process. It's not an event. It's a process. And that process takes time because uh, you know, a certain producer or a certain uh, content media manager or social media manager, whoever from these different huge corporations will have this idea. And they'll say, hey, well, what if we you know, 
put two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars and put it towards this as a title sponsor. Like, well, I've never heard of of, of uh, League of Legends, or I've never heard of StarCraft, or I've never heard of Hearthstone. Why would we do that? And the person shows, well, look at all these metrics provided by you know ESL. Look at all these metrics of viewership. Look at you know hours watched, this and that, this and that. And they can look at other trends and other uh, research in, in esports as well. And they go, okay, we'll do you know half that budget or a quarter of that budget just to get our feet wet to see what it's like. And if ESL or another production company is able to create a great product that resonates very well with the audience, resonates well with where the money's coming from, we call that old money or the old guard of media, then more conversations start to happen. The placement of ESL America in Burbank is not just by happenstance. <laughs> um, these conversations I always look forward to. I won't reveal if they're happening yet or now, but you can find out for yourselves by looking at the last IEM event or the IEM event in New York. Look at who some of the sponsors were and think to yourself, was that happenstance that happened? Or are people trying really hard to really open up these avenues of advertisement to these large corporations, to this old guard, this old money? So as long as more of those conversations keep happening and more fantastic events keep happening, not just from ESL, but from everybody else out there, then more of these conversations will happen, more risks will be taken, more trust will happen after those risks are taken where these, these studios and these corporations and advertisers start working more and more together. And as long as the audience is there, we all recognize that different games have different audiences. Different channels on ESL will have different audience bases. And to really recognize uh, what an audience wants is really, really tough, especially in the world of, of Reddit and the double-edged sword <laughs> of, of, uh, of being anonymous on the internet, right? I mean, there was, there was an instance uh, in Hearthstone where the Twitch chat was just ber saying really mean things, really n just nasty things uh, about one of the players, and they were doing it in a joking mode. I, I don't like keyboard cowboys, these guys that, that, that can do whatever they want you know, on Twitch chat and, and in a sense get away with it because if we turn on sub mode uh, to kind of punish what had happened, then that punishes a lot of people that were not involved at all. And so to kind of think about different challenges of, of how to create and maintain a show that's you know for all audiences or a show that's for a mature audience, which is different. And it's really based on the game rating. Uh, do you make a show for Halo, it's a rated M game, so if guys are cussing like crazy as players in the booth, you know, to us it's a little bit big of a deal because, again, you look at FCC rules and sponsorships and stuff. If Nissan came in, they like, we're not used to somebody saying the F word all the time in a football game. We don't want the same thing to happen in, uh, in, in eSports because it takes too long to explain. And the people that are involved, you know, like their kids may want to watch and they see that and they go, whoa, this is different from television and they want to drop out. It just creates a lot of complications when you have that. But if you all recognize, like, hey, this is a mature game, people are going to cuss, and it's done at a relatively okay uh, times. It's, it's done in a, in a frequency that's not all the time. Then you can like, all right, we understand this is a mature game. So some of that, you know, you, you realize this is kind of the power of the Internet to do this stuff, or the Internet's a little bit of the Wild West to keep these things kind of open, but you, you can't have that for a rated teen game or an everyone game or Minecraft. You're not going to watch, you know, you're not going to let your kid watch a Minecraft um, uh, commentary or, or show or somebody's, you know, swearing profusely. It's, 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 just, it's part of the American culture. And, and to some extent, I think cultures around the world, you know, they, they want something that's uplifting, uh, that, that's, that's, you know, fun to watch and you can share it instead of, oh, you should have watched this, but uh, me be careful because, you know, they had... Don't let your kids see it because there's a lot of bad language and, and girls in bikinis or something like that, which, you know, any red-blooded male American 20 years old doesn't mind a girl in a bikini, but that has to make sense as well, right? Do you want to have a show which is a bunch of girls scantily clad in bikinis and then you have the players come out? That's not going to resonate with your audience. It's going to look too uh, chauvinistic and a little bit too sexist, uh, sexist for this type of, of you know, modern audience who, who a lot of people will think like, well, they're just doing this to get eyeballs and stuff. So you, you have to think about all those things, man. I don't mean to go on a tangent too much, but you look at it, you look at a piece of paper and you sit down and you go, hey, you want to create a show for this? And you think all these scenarios and no to this and yes to this and no to this and yes to this, but later that's a no. Anyways. <laughs> no, I mean, that that's that's awesome, man. That's great. I mean, it's it's kind of fun and interesting to hear from a from a first person perspective of how how you look at a, a broadcast like that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, mean I, I mean, I mean, it just seems uh, a lot goes through your head. I mean, how do you sort of keep track of it all, or or is it just kind of on the fly, like you're trying to figure it out? 
you writing yeses and nos down on a checklist? Like, what are you what are you doing here? I I have a I have a couple uh, programs on my phone that I write a lot of ideas on that I try to implement. I'll discuss some ideas with a couple key people. I try to keep a lot of stuff really tight, really really close to the chest. Um, because they may have an idea, and I really love the idea, and I'll bounce the idea around uh, to a couple, two or three people, and then I'll start thinking more about the idea, and I think, well, there's a better way to do this, or what am I trying to accomplish with this, and if, is there a more effective way, budget-wise, to do it this way? And it's, it's not only you know money you have to think about; it's also time. Um, and, and we we take that very seriously at ESL of, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays are World of Tanks. Well, what's happening Monday? What's happening Tuesday? What's, or Tuesday during the day? What's happening Wednesday? What's happening Friday? What's happening over the weekend? How do we kind of unite the viewership to see what's happening every day for ESL? Um, it's a little bit of a, of a task that we're kind of getting to as well with enough programming, which is great, right? So so kind of going back to, to uh, your thing about... Um, you know, television and looking at that, looking at networks, how do networks work? How does promotion of one show lead into another show? How does that work? Can we do that? Is that a good idea right now? Maybe not right now because you have a separation of the different channels based on the different games, right? You know, Evolve doesn't want to be hosting a StarCraft II channel and vice versa. They're separate brands or completely separate companies. And you think, well, what if, you know, what if there was some sort of handoff that was hosted on Twitch? How do you build that type of network? It's kind of ideas like that. And, and putting them down on paper and going, we're not ready for that yet, we can't get there yet, or you know, maybe I need to talk to somebody about this. Um, day nine, uh, who's somebody a lot of people will look up to, he says, just do it. You know, so there's nothing stopping you, just do it. Well, there's a lot of things you know, stopping people to make their dreams come happen. A lot of that is money and, and, and time you know, to do it, and so you have to do it in very small steps. And for me, it's small steps. Okay, what do I want to create? I want to create this show. For who? For this audience? Will it work? Yes, it'll work because of this. Okay, what's it look like for a season? This is what it looks like. All right, how much does that cost? And then looking at every single person that's involved with the broadcast. How many times is it broadcasted per week? And then looking at how long is the broadcast going to be? Then looking at do you want to have this online or do you want to have this in person? What kind of cost that looks like? Um, that, from initially having the spark, having the idea... And then putting it on paper, and then act, it's like it's like a, a construction for a blueprint, right? You put it all in the blueprint, and you finagle the, blue, the blueprint, you change the blueprint, you do all sorts of things. You, you get the fire marshal involved to make sure the fire exits are there. I mean, you do everything <laughs> you can until you implement it, and it it, it is a can be very very daunting. It can take months. It can take even longer than that. Uh, but once it comes to fruition, even when you have different people coming in and changing some things here and there or getting feedback and changing some stuff, you're able to create something that's awesome and that you're very proud of. The hardest part is to get people to watch it because there's so much stuff to watch on television and on Twitch. And that's where your marketing team comes in and you just hope and hope and do your best to, to have people watch and, and you start to see an audience grow and it's really fulfilling. Um, but anything that you do is a risk. Anything you do as an artist, which I, you know, I consider this stuff creating something out of nothing is, is part of being a storyteller. Uh, it takes a risk, and and that's the hardest part about it is is taking that risk and really believing in it, in this type of project. And if it pans out, great. If it doesn't, it's a great learning experience. And you go back to the drawing board and maybe have a different idea that works a little bit better down the road. That's awesome, man. So uh, I think that's a great point to sort of. I have no more questions. I have no more really things to say. But I mean, any any closing comments? Any any closing statements? Any any shout outs you want to go ahead and and do before? Sure. If if you support a show, support it. You know, if it costs five bucks to subscribe to it, pay the five bucks for a month or donate something. Just a little bit helps. Uh, the economy in esports is stronger than when it was. Definitely back in two thousand eight, we can all agree there, and it's stronger than when I started uh, four or five years ago. But any type of broadcast takes money, and that money either comes from the client, comes from the audience, or it comes from advertisers. As we continue to grow and build. Remember <laughs> that uh, it does make a difference when when you do tune in. Those numbers do make a difference. It does make a difference when you do tweet. It makes a difference when you do use that hashtag. It makes a difference when you do jump on Facebook and participate in a caption contest because it shows engagement. And for better and for worse, sometimes that's what old money is looking at right now. They're looking at this new trend of social media and how to access that. Um, 
Now, just because you have a bunch of followers on Twitch or on Facebook or you have some sort of social media impact does not mean that people will spend money. Unfortunately, I'm seeing a trend that is excusable, but not the best choice of bringing in, you know, all these people with all these big social media followings to come and do a show, right? And I think, oh man, we're going to have all this audience wants our show. And then after that, they're going to watch our show. They may get a little bit from those people, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. If you want people to watch your show, create a great show. Don't rely on these social media superstars to come in and, and, Keep your audience. They may bring a lot of eyes to it, and I can understand kind of a marketing value, why it'll, it'll work. But if you want people to watch your show, create a great show. That's, that's it. And there's no real magic wand or special formula. It's hard work, creativity, and it's risk. And if it's done right with the right people, then it can happen. A lot of people in this industry try to chase the idea, right? The, it's the idea that matters more than people. Ideas come from people. And if you have good people that work hard and believe in what they're doing, that's where good ideas come from. Awesome. So, Clutch, thank you so much for coming on, talking to me. Haven't talked to you in a while, buddy. But uh, So I have your Twitter handle there. It's at Clutch808, correct? Yeah, Clutch08. Uh, awesome. So, yeah, go ahead and follow him there, guys, and then go ahead and listen to the man. Go ahead and subscribe to ESL. They have some great content coming up. Anything coming up from ESL soon? I will yeah, World of Tanks continues in its season, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 5 p.m. is the first match, 4.45 Pacific Times, a pregame show. We have Hearthstone going on on the weekends, definitely this Saturday, uh, and on Friday nights as well. And we have uh, some more League of Legends stuff coming up here in the U.S. America studio. Well, maybe not necessarily in the studio, but it evol um, involved with the America team. Then we have PAX. Around the corner, PAX East. Yeah, coming up real quick. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think ESL America will have a very strong presence at PAX. I think. I can't confirm yet. But, uh, yeah, it'll be a good time. Um, and, again, thanks so much for the huge embrace we received as ESL America to the rest of the esports world. And we will continue to put out uh, the best products available. So thank you so much. Awesome. With that being said, guys, Please stay tuned for the other segments I have. A lot of them coming and planned up. So uh, thanks again to Clutch, and, and uh, go ahead and watch ESL.